Kia ora koutou. Ko Tiffany Taku Ingwa, he kairuruku taufainga a hau ki Manaki Whenua. Good morning everyone, my name is Tiffany and I am the Events Coordinator at Manaki Whenua Landcare Research. A lot of you would have joined us previously for a webinar session, but before I hand over to Christine, I'm going to run through a couple of technical slides to ensure that your experience with us online today goes as smooth as possible. If you've heard this all before, you can ignore me for the next minute. You will notice you have a control panel at the side of your screen. If at any time this collapses, you can bring it back by simply clicking the orange arrow button. If you are having sound issues and you can see my mouth moving but cannot hear a word I'm saying, please grab the PDF in the handout section and this has instructions to resolve this quickly. The audio panel is where you can control where the sound plays on your computer. Select the drop down arrow and choose your audio output. During the presentation, you may have questions that you want to be covered in our Q&A session. You can do this via the chat panel throughout our session today. You will notice it is pretty small and it will be hard to read other attendees' questions. Select the pop-out icon on this panel and drag the corner out to make it as big as you want. You can also use this feature if you are having technical issues and ask me any questions. Questions asked by the audience show as anonymous and a green colour in the chat panel. However, please note we will use your name in the Q&A session. If I respond to you regarding a question, this will show as red. Now over to Christine to introduce you to our fifth Link Online session. Kia ora and, and welcome from uh, sunny Wellington. Um, today we have Alison Greenaway and Lara Taylor. They're both based in Auckland and they've been uh, working on uh, a range of projects, but uh, one in particular that they're going to focus on and deliver the seminar on holistic governance from the mountains to the sea. Um, they're best to introduce you to themselves and their work as as they get started. Um, I will come back to help manage our questions at the end. And so this is just a reminder that the earlier you get your question into the question box, the more likely we are going to be able to uh, respond to that at the time. We will come back to you with other questions individually or collectively later if there are too many. So um, without further ado, I'd just really like to hand over to Lara to get us started. Kia ora, um, kai no tato. Fiti ora ki te pai ao, ki te ao marama. Fiti ki runga, fiti ki raro, e nunu ki te pōhatu, e nunu ki te rākau. Ti taha ki tēnei taha. Ti taha ki tera taha. Ti hei mauri ora. Thank you, Lara, Christine and Tiffany. Namahi mahana kia koutou. Over the last few years, I've had the privilege of working with researchers, artists and videographers funded through the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge with the aim of circulating narratives to enable ecosystem-based management. Today's presentation shares a few insights gained through this work, and I hope these insights will energize your work. You will hear from me first, then Lara Taylor. I'll quickly touch on holistic governance, narratives, and the multimedia resources we created to support conversations about ecosystem-based management. I'll then pass to Lara, who will shift focus from our past work to future activities. I acknowledge that what I'm talking about today was very much a collaborative effort. Some of the people involved have joined this webinar, and we're all available for further discussion if you'd like to get in co contact with us. At Manaki Whenua, I and a number of my colleagues pay a lot of attention to the co-production of knowledge and practice for sustainable development. Narratives, purako, and storytelling are key to co-production because they support us to think and do nature-society relations differently. The aspiration of holistic governance links people, places, and policies striving for well-being integrated catchment management, landscape scale planning, systems thinking, and ecosystem-based management. 
EBM. Some of these terms will mean something to you and for others they'll be new jargon. But here are some examples of these concepts at work in Aotearoa New Zealand and overseas. Included in this slide are images from the integrated Kaipara Harbour Management Group in Northland, Cape to City in the Hawke's Bay, and the latest wellbeing budget from government and an international journal paper exploring systems thinking, education and chemistry. Central to them are central to all of these are ideas of making better connections and breaking down silos to achieve improved outcomes for people and places. In this presentation, I share with you some of the ideas we worked with about how change is possible in Aotearoa New Zealand. So here's the first of these ideas. When research and management only focus on components of programs for social and environmental change, be it for integrated catchment pl management planning, well-being reporting, or as in our case, ecosystem-based management, the connections across these programs become less visible, making holistic governance less likely. If we had more time, here I would discuss methodological individualism, philosophical genealogies, and the assemblage of outcomes. But my point for today is that the circulation of narratives of holistic governance from many parts of society helps to create alignment and keep visible integrative efforts across New Zealand. Our work for the Sustainable Seas Challenge was informed by the Kyoto Kitai concept. This concept is influencing policy and operations across land and sea. Kyoto Kitai is narrated as a comprehensive, culturally based, mountains to the sea natural resource management framework. This Tiao Māori view aligns with other scientific views that we urgently need to manage adverse effect, environmental effects across boundaries, Kyoto Kitai, for the well-being of marine and coastal environments and for ourselves and future generations. Through our work, we were called to consider and to feel how everything in Te Ao Marama, the world of light and enlightenment within which we exist, including all ecosystems, are interconnected through whakapapa and whanaungatanga. So in 2019, five multimedia resources were created and circulated through the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge weaving narratives of Kyotokitai and doing economy differently. Stories showing how New, Ze New Zealand's economy already comprises a range of ways of doing economy that are focused on well-being, on the well-being of future generations. Weaving those narratives with stories of collective action and ecosystems limits. That we can't rely on individual choices and behaviors. Instead, society and its systems need to be designed with the recognition that there are ecosystem limits, environmental and planetary boundaries. A link to the resources was sent to you in your invitation to this webinar and is avail available at the link at the top of this slide. The, this table provides an overview of the resources. At the top is a comic or a graphic novella. Uh, this five page uh, document is great for using in a range of settings. And it's a short graphic novel that tells the intertwined story of Oi the Petrol and a woman named Grace. It's one that steps you out into the future and then looks back over 15 years to see the changes to that place and how people were able to collectively care for the place. The narrative concept we worked with here was one of care and we, it's a human and non-human view of caring for place. The second 
resource that we created is a very large poster. So if you print this one out, print it on A1, and when you have it printed out, there's plenty of room to make it interactive. So you can put details of your place, your stories, your issues on the map too. Um, this, this poster aligns examples of the many EBM-like initiatives already occurring in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So we'd done a lot of uh, case study research prior to making these resources, and so a lot of the details of what we found out are documented in this poster. And it helps to think about connections between land and sea, between cultures and knowledge systems, and between policy and practice. The narrative concept we worked with for the poster was connect, kia te ki tai, thinking connectedly across spatial scales from mountains to sea. The third resource in the table is a video, and this one is, features existing examples of blue economy at work in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And it looks at particularly industry examples um, that are already doing things differently. This one focuses on the narrative concept of generating and it asks what might be possible in livelihoods and economies in the marine space. The next video was filmed in Mai Tai Bay in Northland and it details the story of the hapu there and the work that they did implementing rahui on a local beach and coastal area in order to restore diversity there. The video is fronted by a member of the hapu and, it, and the story is very much told from the, the hapu's perspective. So the narrative concept we are working with here is one of um, protecting and we look particularly at um, this example of rahui. The final video is another one that steps out into the future. In 50 years time, it has a fisher person looking back over the changes that were made in order to enable this multi-use um, marine area to be, be shared in order to be able to protect and work within ecosystem limits. So this resource uh, features the narrative concept of sharing and it looks at the practices of negotiation that enable the marine area to be shared. Now sitting behind all of the work represented in this table is our ideas that social impacts of mission-led science include building and maintaining connections between knowledge, people, places and policies that enable system shifts. So the researchers in this team paid particular attention to the settings in which these resources were shared and reworked and the relationships and conversations that they support. As we developed, shared and reviewed the resources, amidst the complexity and competing interests we were working with, we found it helpful to step away from the urge to define ecosystem-based management and instead to work with shared principles that will support the achievement of ecosystem-based management or something similar. This step is likely to be applicable to concepts of well-being regenerative agriculture and the circular economy which are currently gaining attention. We also found it productive to move away from trying to persuade target audiences with information to resourcing a conversation across sites, worldviews and policy frames. Deep tensions of rights, responsibilities and allocation became visible through this work. By working with a range of narratives of holistic governance, mission-led science is more, more able to navigate the incongruities of politics and power between stakeholders. Narratives of rights and responsibilities and allocation and loss could be reframed to support the, shift the system shifts required. So after developing and re reviewing these resources through networks connected with the Sustainable Seas Challenge, we found that they have a wide reach. We think that a number of you might find them useful for strategic work, shifting silos, 
and fostering integrative initiatives. Indeed, narratives enabling holistic governance surely must be key to Aotearoa New Zealand's post-COVID responses. Many of you are currently finding ways to align budgets and priorities across your organisation, councils and ministries. Our multimedia resources can support brainstorming and strategic planning across sectors and organisations. Please share these resources as part of your strategic planning processes. We also encourage you to focus on these five simple but productive and provocative points as you determine how your programs will enable more holistic governance. The image on this slide stemmed from a conversation where these prompts were used to understand how actors and drivers were shaping ecosystem-based management in Aotearoa, New Zealand. In creating the image, this poster, we were able, they helped, the prompts helped to re reframe marine governance beyond more traditional and problematic delineations of aquaculture, commercial, customary, and recreational fishing. So to keep it simple, holistic governance from the mountains to the sea will be supported by efforts investing in generating diverse ways of doing economy in Aotearoa, New Zealand, caring for places through collective action, sharing across administrative boundaries, connecting knowledge, policy and practice at various scales, protecting ecosystems by recognising and supporting kaitiakitanga. On this note, I now turn to Lara Taylor, who will give a brief nod to new work happening through the Sustainable Seas Challenge, and then we'll take your questions. Nā mihi, Alison. Tēnā koutou. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes on this slide, so I just want to quickly provide some structure. I'll start with a personal note, um, including an example about an initiative which I believe demonstrates the type of effort Alison's just spoken about, which we require for holistic governance. And then I want to end with a brief description of this Phase 2 Sustainable Seas project, which will build on our Phase 1 work. Ko paero te maunga, ko waikato te awa, ko te arawa te waka, ko nga te tahu te iwi, ko ohaki te marae, no te whānau mihi nui ahau. In my pepeha, I've just described our tūranga waiwai out at Ohaki, which is in these photos on the slide. Our land and our marae is on the banks of the Waikato River, um, up near Taupo. And in the context of Kiyutaki Tai, Mountains to Sea, you can picture the water that flows from the snow-capped Maunga to Lake Taupo, to our Awa, and all the way out to the Moana at Port Waikato. These pictures were taken last weekend, um, and you can see there's some native plantings being done recently. Um, you can see my daughter collecting seeds. This is signs of our hapu starting to regenerate our local ecosystem and working towards healing our whenua and our whānau. In those photos, you can also see um, Sam Judd, who is one of the founders of Sustainable Coastlines, which is a well-known charity organisation, which has had huge impact cleaning up our coastlines and waterways and educating our communities. Sam came to our whenua, though, to hear our dreams and walk and talk with us in relation to his next major initiative, which is Te Mahiri Whakauka, or the HOPE Project. This is a nationwide large-scale project to develop capacity of 32 whānau and hapu-based enterprises. It's an urgent response to the COVID situation, but also responds to some of the major environmental and socio-cultural issues that are not so new. Each of the enterprises will employ 50 people, annually produce and plant 500,000 native seedlings, and feed 200 whānau through market gardens. This concept is based on a proven model They've already established the Punu River Care Trust, also in the Waikato. And this hapu has developed 30 jobs and they're training up their rangatahi and revitalizing their waterways and themselves. Ultimately, their tributary also contributes to healthier receiving environments downstream at Port Waikato. I'm highlighting the HOPE project because it's this kind of thinking that I think we need. 
This project is generating diverse ways of doing economy, caring through collective action, sharing, connecting and protecting through kaitiaki tanga. If the government funds this project, then that's 32 whānau and hapu that are enabled. And then from those initial 32, they'll be fully capable to roll this model out wider with their own whanaunga across the regions, scaling up and having impact across boundaries, kiuta, kitai. In one of our five key narratives, um, which Alison spoke about, the film about the Rahui placed up in Maitai Bay in the far north, Fetu Rutane poses the question to the Crown, how can you whakamana us in our communities? Because the current system is failing them. While Te Whānau Moana are doing their part at Maitai Bay and others highlighted in our narratives in the Kaipara, Tikapa Moana, Motiti Island, organisations such as Mountain to Sea Conservation Trust, White Bay Connection, Experiencing Marine Reserves, they're all doing their huge parts as well. But those efforts should be better supported by others, including but not limited to government, as well as scaled up by further efforts in surrounding areas. Because as we know, adverse effects on land and sea accumulate. Um, and those impacts, pollution, sediment, they don't know or respect artificial boundaries drawn on a map. So Tamahiri Fakuka found a way to whakamana our communities at scale. And this is a very useful model, I believe, and a way of thinking for us to support and learn from. If we go back to the image I started with of the wider catchment that our marae sits within, now imagine these healthy whānau based enterprises established at Tūpuna Marae, all along that catchment from Tūrangi through Taupo, along the Waikato, all the way to the port. This is the kind of scale we need to be thinking about if we truly want to improve our overall ecosystems across bioregions and political boundaries. If we want to prevent tipping points being breached and at its broader scale, improve the health and resilience of Aotearoa as a whole, including ourselves within that ecosystem. And finally, and this might sound a bit airy fairy to some of you, imagine our country as Papatuanuku herself. As the legislation of Te Uruwera and Whanganui Treaty Settlements has encouraged us to. Picture the awa, the maunga, the whenua as all parts of her korowai or her cloak. And then think about how restoration of one awa or one maunga in catchment is like fixing a hole or a tear in her korowai. Yes, that is very important and we need that to happen. And over time, we may patch up her whole korowai if we are also able to prevent new tears and patches from emerging. But Papatonuku is our earth mama, and we need to care for her the best we can. She deserves the best korowai because she cloaks and shelters and provides for all of us. We have an intergenerational responsibility and obligation to her, to our tūpuna, to ourselves and our tamariki and future generations. Picture Papatonuku's korowai, our korowai, it should be abundant, flourishing and self-sustaining. Then all of her tamariki, the birds, insects, trees, people will all flourish too. So what will that take? In the next phase of Sustainable Seas, I'm co-leading a project with Meg Parsons from the University of Auckland, and we'll be looking at how we could help to enable kaitiakitanga and EBM. This will build on the research from phase one, including the narratives we've talked about today, and it will involve a number of other researchers and practitioners, including Alison and Sean Awateri from Manaki Whenua, um, Dan Hikaroa, Tiatarangi Sayers and Kura Paul Burke, who were both on the panel yesterday for the DOC and WWF webinar. Um, and it involves a lot of co-development partners as well from Hapu, central and local government, industries and others. So we're aiming to deepen our understanding of how we can enable holistic approaches on the ground in ways that empower both science and Matauranga Māori. And our understanding of the concept of EBM and the principles underpinning that. In yesterday's webinar, Kaitiaki Tanga o Te Moana, the panellists really emphasised the point that we cannot address the sea without the land. They are all part of one overall system. The Moana is a receiving environment of effects associated with land-based activities. But looking at management from a holistic ecosystem-based perspective, we have the ability to develop tools, strategies and practices applicable across those domains. So we'll be taking a case study approach um, and we'll have a technical advisory group set up which will inform and shape the project throughout the three years. We'll be working with our partners to identify what works, what doesn't and for which parties and we'll consider various socio-political and environmental contexts because we know one approach won't fix them all. 
So we'll look at what tools it takes to achieve high impact in different contexts. Ultimately, we want to develop a toolkit of different collaborative approaches that will be helpful for various audiences engaged in these processes within their respective rohi. We want to assist with enabling and empowering communities on the ground, and that will include capacity and capability building with central and local government. I see Christine there. Have I gone on too long? <laughs> One more minute. One more minute, okay. Wait. Basically, we are just um, hoping that we'll assist with the scaling up of holistic governance and management um, and supporting a philosophical change in the way that we're governing and managing and caring for our environment and each other. Kia ora. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Lara. I am going to cut you off there because there's a few questions coming in and we do want to do our best with them. Um, just rest assured, if you've got other questions, send them on through. Um, we we will uh, get back to you on them. Uh, but the first one that I did want to um, tackle was uh, going back to the um, video about the blue economy and a question from Andre Silvera. Did we encounter links to consumers such as certification processes that promote awareness amongst consumers and accountability to producers? And um, do we have any examples of links between supply chain systems and ecosystem perspectives? That might be one for you, Alison. Yes, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, that's certainly at a level of detail um, further than what we were working with. So we were working uh, with the narrative of the blue economy and doing the economy differently and some examples. So sure, as part of those examples and the background work, uh, there are people uh, exploring what you're talking about. So I'll hand, suggest that you get in touch with uh, Nick Lewis uh, or others at, at, who are involved with the Sustainable Seas Challenge and um, particularly the blue economy aspects there. Um, I'll also follow up with you directly afterwards and I could um, email you some of the, the people there. Thank you. Thanks, Alison. Um, this is now a really big picture question. Is there any interest from central government to use these tools to inform national policy? That's what we're hoping. That's why we're doing sharing them with you today. And so um, I, you know, I look forward to, um, it'd be great if we could see you all clapping and thumbs up, but I can't. So I'm looking forward to hearing, yes, there is much interest from you all in this. Certainly um, in our review process, so we shared them um, through the networks connected with the Sustainable Seas Challenge and also our own research networks. So we've had interest um, from different ministries and actually a range across both the MPI, DOC, MFA. So yes, the, uh, there is interest and I'm hoping there's um, a lot more now. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, with our project for phase two, we co-developed that our pro full proposal with people from central government. So they have helped to shape that and we are hoping to yeah, inform them, help inform their national policy. And we developed this very much. Government as well. There's also Iwi and Hapu and industries who also want some of these tools. And these were sort of seen as a pilot for us, just a, um, a taster, and, and we're hoping that people will take some of the ideas and go on and develop further res resources um, that will do similar work. Okay, I've got two really quick questions that I'd really like to fit in. Um, Bill Barker, I am abridging your question slightly because it was far too long, but um, have we seen examples of local government playing a constructive role in some of these collaboration examples? Indeed, I mean, that's the whole point is that it's when local government are working with iwi and working with central government that you actually see the change happening. So the examples that we've got on our map are where you actually see some of those um, collaborations happening. Um, some of them require shifts in legislation in order to make the changes. Um, and others didn't. So yeah, it's it's well worth delving into some of those examples where you see local government is a big part of it. Thanks, Alison. Last question. This we haven't had a question like this before. How do artists become involved? 
involved in these programs. Uh, we went out and approached them. So we um, had been involved with some artists in previous work and uh, so had a sense of what was possible and then asked through networks. And um, so uh, if you are an artist looking to get involved, um, I suggest you get in touch with researchers and let them know that you're available um, because it's certainly a growing part of what we do is working with artists. That's great. Look, thank you. Um, there's a couple more questions here. We will come back to you individually and collectively um, with notes on our on our website and, and to follow up on this. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to the team, um, Lara and Alison, and hand back to Lara to, to finish off for our session today. Kia ora, Christine. Unuhia, unuhia, unuhia ki te uru tapu nui, ki a wātia, ki a māma, te nāko te tinana, te wairua i te ara takata, koea rā i rungu, whakaria ake ki runga, ki a tīna, tīna, haumie, huie, taekie. Taekie. Thank you and goodbye.